Welcome to Midday Live on TV3 with me, Martin Isidu Data. It's live from our studios here at Adesanwe in Accra. Coming up within the next one hour. U.S. House of Representatives Speaker Nancy Pelosi lords Ghana saying her delegation was in the country to learn and pay their respects. Also coming up, government suspends the concession agreement with power distribution services, PDS, and assures consumers it will not affect power supply. And female police officer in Sagnarigu municipality of the northern region shot dead. On the foreign front, North Korea fires two short-range ballistic missiles off its east coast, according to South Korea's military, the second of such launch in a week. Thank you for staying with us. We have details of all these stories and more, including business, sports and entertainment all coming up for you. Let's start from the House of Parliament because the Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi, says the United States of America can learn a few things from Ghana, especially in the area of human rights. Addressing Ghana's parliament as part of a congressional visit to the country, Nancy Pelosi said Ghana stands as a, sh a shining example on the African continent on how it has promoted peace and security and extended that through peacekeeping missions to other countries. America salutes you for your leadership in global peace and humanitarian missions. Indeed, Ghana was the first country in which America sent, to which America sent Peace Corps volunteers. Peace Corps was born in America, but it learned to walk here in Ghana. Today, Ghana is among the top 10 contributors to the UN peacekeeping. America continues to look to Ghana as a partner not only in advancing security and peace, but upholding human rights and opportunity for all, regardless of who they are. Together, we can bring a better future for our children, a better world that so many in both our nations sacrificed to build. Uh, let's move away from Parliament and uh, go on to one of the breaking stories that a lot of us woke up to, which is the fact that government has, uh, you know, Cancelled the agreement between PDS, in fact, suspended the agreement between PDS and ECG. So, government of Ghana has suspended its concession agreement with power distribution services with immediate effect. A statement signed by the information minister, Kujo Ponkruma, said the decision follows the detection of fundamental and material breaches of PDS's obligation in the provision of payment securities demand guarantees for the transaction which have been discovered upon further diligence. PDS took over the operations and management of the Electricity Company of Ghana on Friday, the 1st of March, 2019, after winning a bid to manage the operations of ECG for 20 years. But the statement suspending the agreement explained that the demand guarantees were key prerequisites for the lease of assets on the 1st of March, 2019, to secure the assets that were transferred to the concessionaire. The statement further said that government is conducting a full inquiry into the matter, which uh, outcome will inform its next course of action. Government has also indicated that it has taken steps to ensure the distribution, billing and payment services continue uninterrupted. Electricity Company of Ghana, ECG, is expected to take charge of the management of the utility service provider. And uh, I believe that you've also been following this discussion on social media. So we would want to hear from you on what you, you make of this sudden development. And I would be happy to hear your thoughts as well. Let's go to the phone lines now and um, speak to uh, Kojo Opoku, who is an, uh, a, a policy analyst, an energy policy analyst, and um, want to pick his thoughts on this. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you very much uh, for your time. Uh, good afternoon and good afternoon to your viewers. Now, to start with, um, does this come to you as a surprise following the fact that it seems as if everything was ongoing pretty well until this sudden development? 
Well, no, for me, it doesn't come as a surprise because so all these warnings that we try to give to government and parliament when the agreement for the concession came up and nobody listened. So it doesn't come as a surprise. For, for some of us, uh, we have always said that there were problems with the way the agreement and the, the 51% equity shareholder of the concession was chosen. And if you delve deep into this, uh, what has happened, you realize that most of the problem does not have to do with the miracle, but it has to do with the 51% Ghanaian shareholders that joined the concession. That is where most of the problems have come from. Um, some of us went in from the beginning and tried to shape this concession thing so that it would be in the better um, for every Ghanaian. But obviously, it didn't end up that way. What about what about the the forty nine percentage holding of the Ghanaian components? Did you have an issue with? No, we did not. The forty nine percent shareholder, which is the Morocco company, they were competent. Uh, all the due diligence was done on the Morocco company of Philippines, but no due diligence was done on the fifty one percent Ghanaian shareholder. Right. And before the agreement went through Parliament. Myself, uh, Kofi Brentel of Imani, uh, Mr. Boachi of ASEP, Mr. Kwan Jantua, we all wrote a letter to Parliament. We met with Honorable Jemfi, and I personally, on the day when the committee, the subcommittee of energy and finance, sat on this agreement, I was in Parliament to witness the deliberation. And I will call out the chairman, Honorable SCB, that uh, his committee has let Ghanaians down. And I think anywhere and any parliamentarian that was part of that joint committee has let Ghanaian down because all the issues we raised have now come to bear that we were right. We what, 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 which includes what? What were these issues that you raised? Is it that um, they didn't okay. have the locus to even try to take up this concession or they were not uh, properly okay. registered? What were the issues you raised and how does that tie in Okay. to this sudden uh, story? Okay. You know, there were uh, two processes. There was one request for uh, bidding and then the request for proposal. Right. At the request of proposal stage, the companies that submitted their proposals were all vetted through certain processes. The concession agreement, which is the processes to elect the bidder uh, or the winner, had to go through some rigorous um, background check financial fit for purpose, all the things that were detailed that the companies had to go through. EDF, BXC, uh, Miracle, they all went through this rigorous checking. But then at the tail end, when all these companies have gone through this rigorous background check, financial technical assessment, then the 51% Ghanaian shareholder was added without having to go through the same rigorous background check of technical and financial. Okay. So what some of us pointed out at that time was that this co um, consortium of 51% does not have the muscle, does not have the money, does not have the experience to be able to do this. Now, it wasn't even about technical competence because we know that in Ghana, nobody has ever run such an institution apart from ECG. Hmm. But it was mostly to do with the 51% shareholding was equivalent to injection of $51 million every year. So right. for the five years that the concession, for the first five years, they were to put in a minimum of $250 million. And we have said that the company, the 51% Ghanaian consortium, does not have the financial uh, muscle to, right. to raise $250 million in five years. Then that has now panned into the issue that they couldn't raise the guarantee. Okay. Because if the majority shareholder, which is the Ghanaian shareholder, hmm. is the one that will be assessed, so if they have gone to the banks and the banks will not give them the guarantee to be able to give to the government, if they had listened in the first place when we told them that those people does not have the financial muscle, muscle to, do, to this, do that, this problem will not have arisen. Right, right, right. So anyway, what do you think would be government's appropriate next line of action? Well, uh, it's unfortunate that it's happened. Um, we learned from our mistakes, and like I said, everybody who was involved, MIDA, did not do well. They had let Ghanaians down. Parliament oversight has let Ghanaians down. Um, the only thing is to interimly give it back to ECG, because the good thing is that nobody was sacked. So right. it was all the staff of ECG that went to PDF. 
So now okay. that PDS is no more, is saying the staff of ECG, let's maintain the status quo for now. Then sit with, sit with um, civil society like ourselves. Okay, uh, we understand this space. We are, we, are, we are businessmen and we also are technical people. So they should listen to us when we tell them that these things they are doing will not last. Right. Unfortunately, politicians don't like to listen. If they listen to us, like I said, there is a group called Koseka. We have been at work on this thing. They should call us on board and we will tell them the right approach for some of these things. If okay. government does not listen and they go around the way they did the first one, they will get it wrong again. Okay, thank you very much for your time as always. Uh, Kojo Nsafwa Poku is a, uh, an energy policy analyst helping us understand and put into better perspective how come we have landed ourselves in this particular position where government has abrogated the contract, has suspended the contract between the ECG and PDS. Now ECG is taking over and uh, we await the government's position again on its next line of action. Uh, away from that, the ranking member on the Mines and Energy Committee of Parliament, Adam Mutawakilo, is questioning why government failed to ensure full due diligence before handing over assets of ECG to PDS. He alleged that the government set aside certain conditions precedent to the agreement as approved by Parliament without recourse to Parliament. He spoke earlier on New Day. Why didn't we call the minister that for the sector? I cannot call Mr. JP Amewu to appear before parliament to answer questions that, look, you came to us with a certain number of conditions that must be satisfied, prerequisites, before this agreement is entered. You've taken it to cabinet and you're doing otherwise. Come and tell us why you're doing that. You, are, you hold power for the people in parliament. We are all aware that there, were, there are issues mm. in respect to the capacity Okay. of the local partners mm. to honor their obligations or part of the contract. Mm -hmm. It is clear. Mm. There were issues of alleged fronting. Mm -hmm. By who? No, that's what I'm saying. That's okay. alleged fronting. Mm. Whereby the beneficial owners are seated somewhere mm. where they push some people to take lead. We also have alleged disagreement mm. between these local partners which are fronting and the beneficial owners. And with time, as days go by, we'll get to the truth. This should have been done before. You don't hand over my asset. If within these uh, few months they had misused all the assets mm. that ECG required, can you retrieve that? All right, so uh, clearly you know the background to this story. That is what we all woke up to. And when it broke, uh, there has been mixed reactions following the decision by government to suspend um, the, the PDS concession over what, the, what ECG was doing. Now e e ECG has taken over again. We hit the streets to ask what Ghanaians thought of it. And then also we put together a report for you. In 1994, the government of Ghana received recommendations from consultant Sinex of Santiago, Chile, which it had contracted to study opportunities for reforming Ghana's power sector. Sinex, among other things, envisaged in its recommendations to government the introduction of concession in power distribution. As of January 2019, ECG had close to about 1.7 billion Ghana CD debt sitting in its financial books. These were monies the power distribution company owed power generating companies. It is against this backdrop that former President John Dramani Mahama, in August 2014 in Washington, D.C., USA, signed an agreement with the U.S. government through Millennium Challenge Corporation, MCC, to support Ghana's electricity sector. This was a grant of 498.2 million US dollars meant to undertake specific programs and projects aimed at addressing the challenges in the sector. The decision to implement the power compact was largely influenced by the prevailing power crisis which began in 2013 and thereby resulting in thousands of Ghanaians being thrown out of jobs with an estimated $622 million lost to the economy per annum. The Power Compact 2 was designed to create a self-sustaining energy sector in Ghana by reforming laws and regulations needed to transform the country's power sector. It was also to allow private sector participation in ECG, with a power distribution services PDS expected to make an initial investment of $586 million over the first five years of its operations. 
Per the initial agreement, the concessionaire was to hold 80% stake and manage ECG for a period of 25 years, while the Ghanaian ownership was to be the remaining 20% stake. However, upon assumption of office, the President Ekufuado administration reviewed the terms. Ghanaian ownership was pegged at 51% share, with Miracle Consortium grabbing the 49% stake. The journey towards ECG's concession was not rosy. It was met with stiff opposition from some labor unions and energy think tanks. The Public Utility Workers Union, for example, complained about possible job losses. However, government assured them that would not happen. In January 2019, the concession agreement took full effect. To the shock of many Ghanaians, however, the Information Ministry in a statement on Tuesday, July 30, revealed that the agreement has been suspended. The decision, according to government, follows the detection of fundamental and material breaches of PDS's obligation in the provision of payment securities demand guarantees for the transaction. It indicated that the electricity company of Ghana is expected to take charge of the management of the utility service provider. Another document intercepted by our news team points to the fact that a commercial insurer and reinsurer, Alkut, which is based in Qatar, wrote a letter to ECG dated 16 July 2019, claiming, among other things, that the officer who executed the guarantees from Alkut was not authorized and the guarantees are now void. The letter also accused the officer of committing fraud. A number of meetings were subsequently held between government and stakeholders on July 28, culminating in the suspension of the concession agreement on July 30. Meanwhile, a government delegation is expected to travel to Qatar on Wednesday, July 30, to meet with officials from al Quds in order to verify the information specifically on the fraud aspect. All right, so who are those in charge of the companies that bid to uh, that bid and represented as PDS? Let's give you a breakdown of what it really uh, is. So we already know that there are two major companies involved here. We're talking about um, Maralco, that has 49%, and then also the three the other companies that are owned by some Ghanaian institutions, they came together and they have that 51% of the share. So this is a breakdown of the ownership. That is what we are looking at, and that is where the concern has come from. If you listen to all the experts who have shared an opinion on this. The first company is TG Energy Solutions Ghana Limited. They have 18% of the 51% uh, the uh, share of those that have taken over or are partners in this PDS company. And the directors are Andrew Ejapa Mesa, he is an MPP MP for the second day constituency. Then there is a lawyer called Sophia Koko. She is with the Dankwa Institute. And we have Philip Ayensu. He is the owner of X Men Barber Shop. He is just categorizing the documents we have chanced upon as a shareholder, a main shareholder. And these are the other uh, Ghanaian companies that m constitute the 51%. Santa Power Limited, GTS Power Limited, and Inegia SA of Angola. Now that has a Ghanaian interest. The last company, although it's based in Angola, has a Ghanaian interest. That is why it was added to the uh, Ghanaian concession. So in our subsequent bulletins, we'll bring you the breakdown further of the other persons that are leadership or owners of these companies and the, what role they played in this brouhaha we find ourselves in as a country. Stay with us. We'll bring you that in our subsequent bulletins. Away from that, though, at a ceremony to mark the handing over, Energy Minister John Peter Amewu warned that government will waste no time in taking over operations of the electricity company of Ghana if PDS fails to meet key performance indicators. So let's take you down memory lane and listen to exactly what the uh, Energy Minister said when they were doing the handing over. And I therefore wish to encourage the local participants to demonstrate a high level of core competence. The challenges currently faced by the ECG, as you are all aware, include the following. Suboptimal revenue collections at the Benatip, high electricity theft, 
high aggregate technical and commercial losses, overloading of equipment lines due to capacity constraints, weak feeders, and obsolete equipment, among others. If for some reason, PDS, which we expect to come in and address some of this concern, will be repeating some of these challenges, or will leave some of these challenges undressed, then I don't see the rationale for us gathering here. The Ghanaians will therefore be given the opportunity to do it. If the losses will remain 25%, the power theft will continue to increase. The technical drive to change equipment will remain unchanged. Then it's better we take over our equipment and run it at the same level. John Peter Mehu, former energy minister, and was under when he was the energy minister that this a whole concession was agreed on and handed over to PDS by from ECG by the government of Ghana. So let's come in studio and uh, have a little uh, discussion on this. We've been joined by McDad Mohammed. He is a researcher and a policy analyst with the Institute of Energy and Securities. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us. Oh, to you. start with, um, it looks as if almost every key stakeholder or key voice in this discussion is, ex is not surprised mm. that we've come to this position. But from the position of the IES, do you think that um, heads must roll or some stringent action must be taken following this, uh, this unfortunate development? Well, first and foremost, thank you very much for, for having me. Uh, we actually saw this coming. Oh, you did? It was just a matter of time because you didn't want to jump the gun before the, the, the facts uh, came clear. Uh, before the takeover by PDS, there were some conditions they were, they were supposed to have met. And these conditions were put together by MIDA, which was supervising the transaction. If you leave uh, such transactions in the hands of the politicians, you know what happens. Mm. And it's for this reason that the US government with the uh, compact put together MIDA for them to supervise uh, uh, this process so that at the end of the day, we can have operational and technical uh, uh, competence and efficiency in the management of the, down, uh, the power sector distribution. So uh, with the conditions, PDS uh, not meeting the conditions, uh, uh, they had an agreement of a sort, which was against the, the lease and assignment agreement they signed on 13, 13 July 2018. Uh, they were required to show proof of the existence of funds they were going to mm. invest. They were supposed to provide guarantees that were uh, uh, from banks, which were acceptable to all parties in the transaction, which they failed to do as at the time of the transaction. They were even given an, 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 an extra month from February 2019 to March for them to do something. They still could not do that, but they went ahead and... So with all these handed. red flags, why did we then go ahead? I mean, from, 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 the, from the expert position mm. or the position of an institution like yours, why did you think, from your position, why do you think government still went ahead to give the final approval? Well, it is, it is these actions, this particular move that uh, uh, reinforced our conviction that there were some unseen hands behind the scenes who were willing to bend the rules to favor PDS for whatever reason. That's one of the reasons that people thought, no, ah, you can't be bending the rules this way. We had about 47 conditions precedent. Mm. PDS met about 21 of them, about uh, 26 were not met. And then the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Energy is on record. And they, they could come out and, 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 and state if this is not true. They transferred the conditions precedent to conditions subsequent, which means that conditions PDOs were supposed to have met before they took over were now made into conditions they should meet mm. after they have taken over, mm. which is clearly against the agreements all the parties signed in August, uh, uh, in July 2018, before the takeover. And indeed, indeed, PDS itself had written to uh, MIDA, to the finance ministry and the, the energy ministry and copied MIDA, in which they were stating, and Philip, I used to sign that letter. Mm. We'll make it available to you as the days we'll roll be back. Grateful. They stated clearly that they could not raise the amount involved, and they were asking for uh, reinsurance. They wanted to uh, trans, 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 transfer the bond into okay. uh, insurance. That were guaranteed. That's where Al Kut came, into the, came into the picture. Even that move in itself is an illegality per the lease and assignment agreement, but fine. They were the selected parties. They are facing problems. Let's just give them the chance. Now, PDS comes into the picture, and what they were doing was to reinforce their receivable collections, which is debts which people owed UCG. They okay. were intensifying to collect it and now present that cash as monies 
that they were reinvesting back into, into ECG, company. which is something that my mother at home can do. Mm. You just deploy police and military men and apply pressure and collect the money as receivables and present it that that's what you are reinvesting. Mm. And don't take my word for it. There's a reason why Nancy Pelosi is in this country. And it was not in anybody's interest to come out at this time. It is because there's a force that pushed things to come out at this particular time. So for, for us, it is, it, is, it is not something and, surprising. And, and finally on this, um, as an institution and uh, stakeholders that are also interested in this, and for all of us who are also parties to this, what is the next line of action, reasonable next line of action? Maybe a court case, you think? Well, the, the, the most important thing is that uh, Ghanaians want value for money, whether it is XYZ or PDS or ABC. We want to put on our light and get proper light. Oh, yeah. We want to have efficiency in, and, 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 and proper uh, 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 distribution in the, in the power sector. So I know that as of now, there, there's a lot of meetings going on. Some people are even meeting think tank people to try and skew the discussion in some way. Mm. The most important thing we must let the people of Ghana know is that something has gone wrong, and that wrong must be clearly stated. We must not treat this one like a Mary, where we skip go to the former uh, energy minister without looking down and seeing the people who gave him the advice on a Mary. Mm. There were people who were supposed to have done due diligence. There, we have to do two, two, uh, business due diligence here due diligence you do before the takeover right. and due diligence after the takeover and so the due diligence after the takeover is what people are trying to emphasize which is that after taking the guarantees mm -hmm. now you check and you realize they are fake no the basic due diligence is that they say take the guarantee before, before you hand you over give you did over. not do that due diligence that is what we want uh, 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 the, the people to know what, this happens actually to, is the what happens to the other shareholder, which is Maralco, they had gone through the right process. Mm. They are documenting. They, they, are, they, they, are, they are basically the, uh, P, the people PDS is, 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 is in for. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, certainly, the discussion is still ongoing, and subsequent bulletins and coming days, we'll try to break it down further so we can go all get a better appreciation of this issue. But thank you very much uh, for making time to speak with us. We've been uh, having a chat with a policy analyst and also a researcher with IES, Megdad Mohammed, and uh, helping us put into perspective this issue. Uh, meanwhile, Power Distribution Services PDA says it would go through uh, due process by complying with the terms of the transaction agreement executed between it and the electricity company of Ghana. In a press statement, it indicated that it would continue to act in good faith at all times in the interest of um, uh, in the interest of safeguarding the agreement and the image of the country. PDS also stated it has also um, always acted and will continue to act in good faith at all times to the benefit and interest of all Ghanaians. And that's a statement they released a few minutes ago. Let's shift our attention from all the energy brouhaha. Now, a female police officer in the Sagnarigo municipality of the Northern region has been shot dead. Co uh, Corporal Agatha Nana Nabin was on snap check duty at Malshegu when she was attacked by four armed wheeling men. According to a CID statement, the deceased, together with two other officers, were on snap check duty at the staff filling station on the Kumbungu Road. Four occupants of a saloon car, armed, dressed in military camouflage and wearing face masks, having been signaled to stop got down and shot at a policewoman, killing her instantly. One spent shell of a G3 rifle was retrieved from the scene. The security man at post at the filling station, Yahaya Amadou, said he had to jump over the wall into the garden for his life. When I heard the gunshot, I jumped over the wall. After they left, I came in and saw the policewoman lying down here. The body has since been deposited at the Tamil Teaching Hospital mortuary. Time now for our MTN video report and our citizen journalist Nana Bafonina highlights on the deplorable state of the bridge in Kufurudia. This is a broken bridge at Kufurudia, Nurses Hostel Junction. It's broken and very dangerous. For pedestrians and commuters who ply this road, a broken bridge 
and nobody cares. This is Ghana for you. Nanenina from Koforidia Nessus Hostel. Yes, so you can also send us your MTN video report on the number 055-1433-044. 055-1433-044. Stay with us. We'll be back with more on Midday Live. Thank you very much for staying with us. Time now to do business. The Institute for Energy Securities, IES, and the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers, Ghana, COPEC, have faulted government for increasing the energy sector levy to raise 800 million CDs, while the country loses an average of 1.62 billion CDs annually through fuel smuggling. They are therefore demanding that the government rather mobilizes revenue through blocking fuel smuggling and other ingenious means. The energy sector levy, ESLA, accrued 3.19 billion cities in 2018. Government has proposed a 3.85% increase. When approved by parliament, it will translate into an increase of 20 pesos per litre of fuel and 90 pesos per gallon. A policy and research analyst at the Institute for Energy Security, IES, Megdad Mohamed, outlined the effect of the increment on the economy. For an industry who rely on, let's say, 1,000 gallons a week for their operations, it means that you are adding about uh, almost 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 Ghana cities on their cost of production. It will mean that if they are not able to sustain themselves, they will have to lay off some, some Ghanaian workers in one way or the other, which then comes back to who are you trying to help by bringing in more measures which burdens the Ghanaian. Executive Secretary of the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers, Ghana, COPEC, Duncan Amwa, is of the view that government is resorting to the easiest way of mobilizing revenue. So indirectly, what the finance minister's upward, you know, review of taxes on petrol is seeking to do is to increase fuel prices is to increase cost of food, increase cost of goods and services, increase cost of transportation, increase generally cost of everything in Ghana. The country loses on the average 1.62 billion cities annually through the smuggling of petroleum products. Government intends to raise between 700 million and 800 million cities as additional revenue from the 3.85% energy sector levy increase. IES and COPEC expect government to find more effective and efficient ways and sources of raising revenue. The least he could have done was to redraw some of the taxes and go and look for the revenue from the fuel smuggling program. Whilst the government is targeting 700 million cities, we allow 1.6 billion to go into individual pockets because they bring fuel through unapproved routes. Taxes are incidents on the product when it is sold within the country. That is when we place our taxes on it. Because there's a tracker in the vehicle, it proves that you drove to Ouagadougou and came back, but you drove an empty truck after you have sold it here. It will mean that government lost over here. There's a need for uh, government to relook at tightening the noose around some of these uh, loopholes where some people are benefiting from monies which should be going to the states. COPEC is set to petition parliament to reject the proposed energy sector levy increase. Now, the Supreme Court has declared as unconstitutional the requirement that potential litigants must possess tax identification numbers, which is the TIN, before they can file cases in court. The court declared as null and void and of no effect, indicating it is flawed in the face of the letter and spirit of the Constitution, the rule of law and international conventions. Delivering her valedictory judgment at the Supreme Court, Justice Sophia Dinura said it was unjustifiable for aspects of the Revenue Administration Act 2016, Act 915, to oblige people to have things before seeking legal redress. The court, in a unanimous decision, held that the requirement under the Act was an infringement on the rights of the individual. The court stressed the unhindered access to the court was a provision of the rule of law. The provision, as it stood, according to the court, offended the spirit of the 1992 constitution and thus declared that provision void of no legal effect. 
the plaintiff the Center for Juvenile Delinquency on April 13, 2018, invoked the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court and prayed the court declare aspects of the first schedule of Act 915 unconstitutional. The Ghana Revenue Authority and the Attorney General were the defendants in the case. That's it for business on Midday Live. Let's shift our attention to other stories making the rounds. Let's do uh, a bit of politics now. The chairman of the National Democratic National Development Planning Com uh, Commission, NDPC, Professor Stephen Adai, has made a strong case for research into graduate unemployment to access reliable data for planning. He says government policies have not been able to address the situation due to lack of coordination between research and policy makers and finally the decision makers. According to the Institute of Statistical Service and Economic Research, just 10% of graduating badge from Ghana's tertiary institutions get employed a year after national service. It takes a period of 10 years for majority of the graduates to get stable employment. Addressing a graduating ceremony of the Garden City University College at Kenyase in the Ashanti region, Professor Stephen Adai, who is a former rector of Gempa, believes the increasing youth unemployment can be solved if adequate research is undertaken. It is time for the state not to treat private universities as if they are an aberration. The future of higher education in Ghana lies in the private sector. Council Chair of the Garden City University College, Professor John Eyim, called on government to support private universities to improve on infrastructure. As we all prepare for the first batch of the free SHS graduates in 2020, there is the need to expand our facilities to accommodate the possible huge turnout from the, that program. Our appeal to create a niche in the science-based program has led us to higher operation costs in the area of equipment and environment for lecturers. I therefore urge the government to assist private tertiary institutions with funding, especially those running science-based programs, since we are partners in the provision of education in the country. President of the university, Professor Edward Kwame Asante, said the future belongs to those who adopt a growth mindset. 472 students graduated in various degree programs. That's it for the bulletin for now. When we return, we'll bring you the latest in the world of sports with Yao Ofosulabi. Stay with us. And you know when we say we are going to do it, we'll do it bigger and better. We'll be joined in the studio by... Um, Someone who's going to be telling us about a plot and a plan that TV3, Umiya FM, and all our sister stations are going to be embarking on. And uh, we're talking about the Umiya Festival train. If you've not heard about it, then listen to us now. Thank you very much for joining us in studio. Thank you, Martin. What are the Great. expectations of this grand festival? Well, I'd like to say thank you again. Of course, um, Umiya Festival train started off with Nungwa. Uh, two weeks ago, and it was great and exciting. And so this year, uh, we sought out to uh, take our brands out there, bring some more excitement, and get closer to our viewers and fans, audience across the country. And so we themed it the Unia Festival Training. We're using the festival as being a traditional activity that gathers a lot of people at one place. And so from Nungwa, the train is moving straight to Ada, uh, another beautiful place in Ghana. Now, when you get to Ada, you know that, yes, there's good food, there's good people, and everybody there is expecting us. We are planning something exciting. So it's starting from this particular Friday. Uh, now, tomorrow, the Ada festival, the traditional calendar okay. for the festival starts, as in the 1st of August through to the 8th of August. And the uh, media general led by the Onia TV and Onia FM team is, is going to shut down the Ada city. <laughs> you know, like I say, shut yeah, down the yeah, Ada city uh, with great excitement, with music, entertainment, uh, cooking contests, plus a host of other activities. Right. And uh, for those who are in Ada, they are expecting us. 
what is the message for those who are outside Adam? What are the preparations and plans? What are what are the teasing bits? Well, like uh, like you said, plans? you know, Adam is by 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 the what by, by the sea, the sea as it yeah, were, and right. so the breeze is what we're all looking forward mm. to. There there are lots of people uh, who are looking forward to this particular. Uh, event or well, what what is happening is that like you said when we do it we do it big yeah and so we are making sure we are carrying one of our biggest properties that is music music right. to our dance right. and people look forward to that i'm sure the last time they saw music music there in Adan was some years ago mm. but this time mm. repackaged refreshed refined with some great artists right from uh, here do we know Adan. who these artists are of course i mean uh when we are talking about artists we are talking about yapuno uh, who has a lot of energy style right. and uh, got a lot of songs that the people yeah. look forward to yeah. we're talking about me funny hmm. uh, we're talking about waisa we're talking about luther uh, masani and some other great artists and then we have some secret artists also yeah. that we are not going to reveal yet but you'd have to make a date and come there so you can also enjoy yeah. um that particular uh, festival that is going to be happening sure. in Adan and uh Take us through the days it is starting and what we should expect. So, so for, Wednesday, for, right? for emphasis sake um, for, and for clarity, for people to know what uh, we are actually coming to do, um, on Saturday, on Saturday is the Grand Deba, which starts in the morning from about 10 a.m. And so after the Grand Deba, we bring the music music uh, to them in the night with the Apono. And of course, we don't, we don't go without giving the young artists upcoming talent who are doing so well within the region, the opportunity to be there. So the likes of King Falu and, um, and Masani and all those artists a are Thick squad, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, 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 very strong right. squad. Then on Sunday, after the Thanksgiving service, we are going to have a cooking contest mm. for the women and uh, some of the queen mothers in the area mm -hmm. as well. So it promises to be something really delectable. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Uh, Kenneth you. Addo is um, our head of lifestyle and entertainment here at Media General. So do make a date and join us there in a down for this all important, all interesting party. Uh, before we go though, uh, my colleague Paco Siasari is in the offices of John Peter Mehu to find out the current developments about PDS's uh, takeover of ECG and all the developments. Let's go over and listen to that She's conversation. Since then, I'm here this afternoon in the office of the Energy Minister, John Pitamu, to help us understand what went into the decision taken by government. Thank you very much, Mr. Pitamu, for your time. You're live on TV3. So uh, we had that announcement, uh, the suspension of the contract of PDS. How did you arrive at the decision? Well, uh, thank you and good afternoon to your listeners. Um, uh, the decision to suspend the, uh, the concession agreement between uh, ECG and the PDS is as a result of some um, uh, material evidence that seems to conclude that uh, the payment security which ought to have come from uh, PDS uh, was not well executed and therefore being considered as uh, fraudulently uh, done. And on that basis, um, government think it's important to quickly uh, hold on the assets of Ghanaians. Because don't forget, this is a major asset that we have transferred. And if such a fraudulent uh, activities have been uh, detected, uh, it's proper government takes on action. And that's why government has taken this action to suspend uh, the deal for now while uh, the investigations uh, continue. continues. Now, it's pretty interesting to hear the word fraud in such a big contract like this, a contract that involves over $500 million of the American state government's money to Ghana. Now, some have questioned the due diligence that went into this contract. Do you think they have a case? Oh, yes, of course. Don't, don't forget. And it's the due diligence that have established this uh, by government. Uh, the due diligence is an ongoing process. Uh, don't forget there are conditions subsequent and conditions precedent to this contract. And so the due diligence process is an ongoing process. And that is where we have been able to establish uh, this element of uh, fraud. Of course, which is yet to be validated. Uh, but wise, we wait for the, uh, uh, the validation process. Government have taken this action to secure the assets here. Yeah. PDS, PDS itself says it's going to remain calm. It's issued a statement a couple of uh, minutes ago responding to the decision by government to suspend their actions. Will this come at any cost at all to, to government or to PDS? 
Uh, that would be very difficult for me to quantify it and justify it uh, in terms of uh, any cost estimate. Um, PDS may have undertaken some uh, uh, investment decisions in terms of their operational activities, branding, rebranding, and all those, those sort of things. But that is a responsibility of PDS. I mean, government had not actually, you know, during this period, uh, put in any, any amount of money. Uh, what we, the danger is the, uh, the second tranche of the, uh, the facility the that, of course, uh, is what we all need to see uh, whether it will be threatened as a result of this uh, discovery or findings. But I think what the MCC and the MIDA uh, authority needs to be uh, aware of is the fact that uh, government has you know, taken a decision and, of course, it's government's effort that has led to this. And so I think they will be quite happy. To Mr. Know. Minister, what's the worst that could happen in this contract? You've told them to hold on, you're investigating, so there's a suspension. What's the worst that could happen? Well, I see three scenarios. Um, number one, let's say that uh, the letter uh, which is coming from the Akut, uh, claiming that the uh, payment security is fraudulently uh, done and that they have nothing to do, to do with it and the officer responsible for that had already been suspended and therefore they are taking the issue seriously. If that decisions have been concluded, then of course uh, that automatically will lead to a termination of uh, the construction. That is number one. Uh, uh, number two is that if government take a decision to terminate without validation, there may be some consequences. And that is why government do not take that second option. Now, the third option is uh, if uh, it has been found out that, of course, the uh, payment guarantee of the security have been well executed and our court, which is a executing company, uh, had accepted responsibility for it, and there have been some element of consideration. Then, of course, the process will, will continue. But as we are here now, um, we've not getting that kind of indication from our court, and that is why government is suspending the, the process. So these are the scenarios that I think uh, may emerge in, in uh -huh. yeah. yeah. So, but essentially, what you're saying is that a prima facie case has been made against PDS. Precisely, precisely. As, mm. as, 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 as we speak now. And is the president aware of this? Who? The president. The president of the Republic of Ghana, yes, of course. Uh, he will need to be brief and he's aware. Um, uh, we've had some engagement with him. Yes, please. So I know it's pretty short, but what are the timelines? How long is this investigation going to take? Um, in the meantime, ECG has been asked to take you know, over. What happens next? Well, um, uh, ECG is going in now as a distributor, as they used to do, uh, just to make sure that we have stable uh, power supply without any uh, disruptions. Uh, with regard to the time period for uh, concluding and coming to a conclusive evidence of a detection of uh, fraud, uh, because the word fraud had been mentioned, that again goes to the security you know, agencies to take that. So I would not be in a position to know how long it's going to take the security agencies to, to come up with it. But what I know for sure is also a government delegation that's also been put together uh, to, uh, with the media uh, to, you know, uh, travel to Qatar, uh, the resident office of this executing company, uh, to have some kind of high-level all right, so definitely stay with TV3. We'll bring you more of that interview in our subsequent bulletins. But thank you very much for making time to watch Midday Live. My name is Martin Estiedo Dutta. There is more news on our website, 3news.com. Do have a good afternoon. As always, stay positive. Bye for now.